you know, 20 years ago, I was reading um, Maxine Green's work on a bus in Nepal um, when I was working in two schools. And then I did a teacher, uh, a teacher PGCE and met Pam. And then um, Pam uh, kind of inspired more creativities work and, and music work and thinking differently about education. Um, and so the, the releasing of our imagination this became a kind of a strap, a part of my own DNA and the work that Pam and I did for the last you know, 20 odd years. Um, and so the, the strap line of the school is, is releasing, our, releasing the imagination, celebrating the art of the possible. Um, and it's a free school. So in, in, it's similar to a charter school in the States. Um, we are funded by the government. We have no funding from the university um, and we're still held to account by the, by the government's inspectorate called Ofsted which doesn't really understand, wouldn't understand Maxine Green's work or the idea of social imagination. So because the university, um, so we, we opened in 2015 as a school with, with 120 children and six years on now we, we are, um, have 600 children um, and we serve a community that's on the edge of Cambridge. So this is the, this is the inner circle of our, of our school design. Um, and over time, over these last five years, we were trying to understand what is the what is the curriculum design for our school and how could we share this beyond the walls of the school. So the notion of a compassionate citizen is at the heart of, of our thinking. How do we nurture young people to be compassionate and understand diversities in a more um, enriching, encompassing way rather than the building up of walls that has been in, in recent history. But around Around that, the, third, the starting point is the yellow, the yellow hexagon, that we needed to create an enabling space in which the relationships that we foster within the school um, in a values-led way. So we have five values of empathy, respect, trust, courage, and gratitude. How the relationships create the ethos is the interactions with one another. And then that creates the enabling space. So for example, trust is one of our, uh, our values. If I went around with a clipboard and stomping around saying, why is this not done? We wouldn't create the atmosphere in which people would take risks and release their imaginations, uh, let alone celebrate the possible. So we worked hard on that aspect and really drew from the, you know, the, the idea of teacher a stranger to look fresh, you know, with fresh eyes um, on, uh, on what the, the, the social context is of a, of a, of a school. The blue part really is that we wanted, we drew from the, 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 the well-regarded well research into primary education that said that oracy and dialogue um, is a key aspect of success. Playful inquiry also, that humans are essentially playful and that they're taught not to be playful as we get older. Um, mm -hmm. Habits of mind, so self-regulation, metacognition, understanding how to engage oneself as a learner. They're all three really well-regarded evidence bases and they, they are the golden threads that go through the curriculum. Um, and then the green part is that we, we, we value a values-led curriculum. So we don't just talk about values, we teach for them, with them, within them. We talk, we talk about values, we talk about when values go wrong. Um, and a, a text-rich curriculum so that primary school children need rich language and vocabulary to be able to articulate who they are and how they want to be in the world. And then domain specific learning. So we acknowledge that children think as mathematicians sometimes, they think as artists, they think as musicians and, and, and writers, but, they, but there are also opportunities to connect um, at those, those different domains of learning. So the key question we asked ourselves throughout our history is what, do we, what kind of humans do we want our learners to become? Unfortunately, we've, we've become obsessed with just getting to year six, uh, to the end of primary school, and then passing the exam and then getting rid of them to secondary to high school. So we, we said, right, let's, let's think of what they're gonna be like when they're 40 years old. What kind of readers do we want to engage? What, what kind of um, you know, uh, mathematicians, artists, and then work our way backwards and say, well, what foundations do we have to put into place to enable those 40 year olds to have those kind of rich and enriching lives. And we drew from, um, as well as, um, my own interest in Maxine, Maxine's work is um, looked at the Cambridge Primary Review, which is the biggest piece of academic research done in the UK about primary education. Um, and we drew from their recommendations. Um, and then we started exploring what is this, the idea of a center of research that I'll, um, I'll come to in, in, a, in a minute. Um, so that, so we've been open six years. We have a, value, a, a values-led curriculum. Um, 
and we uh, we kind of foster three aspects flourishing children empowering educators and then the third one is releasing the imagination and we're really set um, on developing a center for research that if i may in a minute share with you what that what the, our vision and intention is for that because that really builds on maxine's work but are there any questions in the meantime that's fantastic um you mentioned um and so how in specific, maybe you could um, elaborate a little bit on how they're releasing the imagination in particular, that text uh, played such a part. It, it, it starts off with how we how we treat um, the educators in our school communities uh -huh. um, and, and the kind of professional development that we that we engage in as, as, a, as a community of practice. So typically in the UK, you want to improve reading. Somebody says, this is a reading scheme. This is how you do it, go and do it. Um, rather than, as I'm sure, you, as you would advocate, you have to start with a reflexive reflexive practice. How do, you, how do you help people become more reflective and then reflexive and able to have agency to make changes in their classrooms, to enable those successes in the classrooms, rather than the system taking primacy and the children and the adults losing their agency and losing their voice so it's yeah so how you know the um trying to help you know teachers who have been um basically squashed into following a system are not delivering what the children need so it, i can't just tell people be imaginative i've got to kind of create opportunities and spaces in which they start stepping back and stepping in to, uh, into, into their new spaces with, with fresh eyes. So, you know, recently oh. we've been, um, I, asked, I asked the teachers recently for a small uh, you know, activity, for example, in our, in our development day, that the teachers had a number of questions that we posed about their children, and they had to write answers to whether they, un whether they knew the answers to those questions. So, for simple thing that, like, does a child have a pet? Do children, you know, what language do they speak? And a lot of the teachers didn't, didn't, weren't aware of the actual human quality of their classrooms. They just thought we need to get through the curriculum, mm -hmm. COVID, we need to do COVID catch up, and they're not stepping back and relating to the human beings in their in their classrooms. I mean, mm -hmm. that's an exaggeration. It's, it's not. I, I know. It's not, yeah. You hear, see, um, and so because of this drive to standardise everything in the UK. And the government is really pushing to standardize initial teacher training, to standardize the professional development. So there's a one route. You go from initial teacher training to headship and you just follow the, the route. It's not creating the innovation or the ambition that's needed, I don't think. And Pam would, would kind of advocate, would say the same thing, I think. So, and a lot of, I, I would say look, most of my colleagues have never heard of Maxine Green. You know, I went to a conference recently um i say recently two years ago and i went to breakfast with a book and the other head teachers on that table said "Ooh, look at you you're reading and it was such a shock to me that it would be a odd thing for a, a leader of an, a learning organization to read and read a book that's that is about education and um so yeah. we've become i think we're, we're trying to become advocates for just thinking afresh you know, we can't assume this, the norm anymore, um, especially you know, people talk about the new normal in, in the UK or building back better or whatever the strap line you want to call. Um, and there's a real first to knowing what that might be. Um, and so we're hoping our school might be a contributing voice to that, that, that kind of questioning. Can I, jump in? Can I jump in and just add three sentences to oh, this as a postscript? And that is that James has, you know, sort of single handedly uh, uh, set up a book series which unlocks research called Unlocking Research. And the third book, uh, which is Unlocking Research and Sculpting New Creativities, has a quote from Maxine on its opening page. And it says, uh, I'm not going to read the entire quote, quote, but it speaks of teaching for openings. These are words of Maxine, and and teaching uh, teaching for openings and daring to seek such openings. And of course, I am not yet. And it seems to me that 
the book, you know, her releasing the imagination, just the titles itself map onto the innovation and the, the source of origin of the uh, creating possibilities, which was part one of that book, community in the making, the passion of pluralism, you know, looking at literacies, creativities, looking at multiple voices, you know, the voice of the teachers as well as the voice of the students. And, and you know, one could summarize all of that by saying it's about her vision, you know, is, is being performed in this school. It's not only her vision, but her values and her view on voices, which is, you know, of children and of teachers and of thinking of the values of, of you know, the future, which is still this possibility and I'm looking at her page 177 when she says, the moving forward, what cannot be precisely predicted, but what is often thought of as possibility. Uh, and wow, you know, uh, and that comes under a chapter that she wrote on standards, common learnings and diversity. Um, so if ever I've seen the performance of Maxine Green embodied in this school, then here it is. Mm, bravo. Um and I should say that, you know, um, Pam was my supervisor for my, for my, my, my PhD. And um, I think Maxine Green's work did, did guide much of the, the theoretical thinking. So my, my study was about going into children's family homes. So going into new spaces that made, that disrupted my own, my own vision and, and awareness of, of not only diversities, but how children were learning and in creativities, for example, how they were being artistic in their family homes. And in schools, we were denying that social and cultural capital because it didn't fit in with our model. Um, uh, it, yeah. No, I'm wondering if, if my colleagues have anything to ask or share. I'm just so blown away by how beautifully you articulate and have extended her her writings into something that's so um, profound, so real um, and uh, so full of action. It, it's We had a lot of that feeling at Lincoln Center Institute when I was there and that was all inspired by Maxine. And we again started with the professional development as you said was the key, the cornerstone <clears throat> to going out and um, but um, I guess, um, yeah, so I'm just so, so uh, delighted and, and um, impressed. Um, and we wish we could come and see your school. <laughs> um, what I'm wondering is um, what are the, some of the ways that you, you, I know your time is limited in this particular Zoom meeting, but going forward, in what ways might we um, champion what you're doing or, um, uh, disrupt you in, in further ways? <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah, it, it was wonderful to hear what you're doing. And um, as a comment, the only thing I think Maxine might have done differently was when the kids walked into the room, she not only would have said hello, she would have ignored all the rest of us and <laughs> talked to them. <laughs> she would wa have wanted to know what they were studying, what they, you know. Um, and I think as a as a question, I promise, you, I promise you, I will go and see them before they. Go <laughs> oh, I know you will. I know you will. Um, uh, I I was curious about the Cambridge report. I just wondered um, where it stood in relation to what Maxine um, Maxine's vision, and whether there were any places, you know, sort of where it doesn't inter intersect, and you have to make some decisions in terms of how you proceed. I think it, you know, it did speak. It did speak about um, primary education as a holistic. You know, it needed a, a, an holistic approach, and that the curriculum can't just be a national curriculum. It has to be a localized. It has to be respond to the communities in which, which we serve. Um, so I think that it, it had synergy there, um, um, but it, it also spoke about professional, highly about professional development, and that um, an inspectorate that is punitive does not foster imaginative, yep. ambitious, innovative thinking. So it was challenging. Unfortunately, Pam, I mean, Pam knows some of the academics who wrote it, but I think the lead academic um, does sometimes have a way to uh, cause conflicts with politicians rather than, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be uh, <laughs> politics, but the politicians basically said, we're not having anything to do with it um, because it was, 
probably a bit too radical in, in some ways and it required money. Um, if, but if, there, there, are, there, are, there is, a, there is a, a, a abridged version that we could find the link to and send it to you. Yeah, <coughs> that'd be great. great. And if, if you look at uh, if you look at the table of contents, just the table of contents of this sort of really thick book, you know, yeah. the, and and the number of post-it notes show its relevance still. And that yeah. is to say, you know, he was looking at how children live, think, and learn. You know how well primary schools link to the reality of children's lives and the impact of government efforts to raise standards and their irrelevancies really. But, you know, he was very, you know, part two is all about children and childhood. Part three, you know, with the voice, children's voice is privileged. And may I say, um, I've been in the presence of James with children, you know, multiple times. And normally uh, we would have been uh, waiting for hours for him to come back. I think he was <laughs> Uh, uh, an English gentleman to uh, yeah. the presence of, of of international women representing Maxine Green, um, and and he so in this in this book is, is looking at children diversity equity, but also you know the the curriculum and the role of curriculum plays past present and future, and had something really significant, really original to say about a curriculum that should be community led as opposed to you know this sort of isolated sort right. of entity and and the final se session is a sort of section is on teachers their expertise their development their deployment their prof professional leadership and workforce reform and uh he had many things to say so much that the government at this end led on another review not called the Cambridge primary review but trying to eclipse this one calling it just a primary review in order to shut down actually sort of soften like like uh, shut down silence the voice of the voices that were thousands of inputs from researchers parents media coverage mm -hmm. Uh, and it was a battle for about three years between wanting to voice the reality of what it is to be a teacher, a child, a parent, and a community and a school in, in, in you know, the 21st century, and a government trying to shut him down. He, in such a way that he employed a full-time media person which was really innovative. And now we all do this when we're putting in research grants that are this big, they're sort of wanting to kind of innovate than to have someone who's handling media, the outward face of a study that is gonna rattle and shift and change things. Because you know, the culture, the cancel culture is alive and well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, even more now than ever. And so back right there, uh, I think Robin Alexander, although a bit of a prickly kind of uh, person who's, you know, just has a, an idiosyncratic way that, that uh, but in 2010, he really led something innovative yeah. and, and would have been amazing if he had met Maxine Green, the world would be a different place. Yes. Yeah. So we... we what we'd like to do and you know what the vision I have for this school and and the ripples that this school will create as as we kind of expand um not only becoming the full school that we're meant to be is to be a, a, a center not a center of research which which still puts research academic knowledge in the hierarchy against practitioner wisdom but to have a center for educational possibilities I wonder if I may share a slide, some slides with you, just to explain what our next step is. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I love it. Um, so the the idea of inspiring the social imagination has been one that we've tried to think about and ask what that really means. Um, and so a lot of, after a lot of discussions with people. Um, Pam and I actually came centered on, you know, settled on this idea of a center for educational possibilities rather than a center for research or of research. And Max 
to their social imagination, the capacity to invent visions, um, as you all know this quote very well, a social, this time for action to repair or renew. And everyone keeps talking about, we need to repair society, you know, renew with new ideas. Um, and we want to be part of that conversation and actually lead on it. So the idea of a center for educational possibilities will really uh, build on Maxine Green's words and uh, the kind of the heartbeat of her of her kind of of her work. We know that we're in code red for humanity, is what the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says. Um, and so there's to sit back and wait for things to happen from politicians is not going to deliver what's needed for our young people. So we identified that there are three existential risks or uncertainties. The one to the survival of planet Earth, uh, the, the risk to greater inequality, inequities and exclusion as democracies start to, to kind of um, uh, not crumble, but to start to kind of weaken or to show their in inadequacies. How do we reinvigorate democracy and inequality and equity? And then the existential risk or uncertainty is children's uh, sense of purpose and meaning or their lack of purpose and meaning. Young people in the UK were saying, what's the point of education if we, our exams are cancelled? So a lot of secondary children were saying, our exams are cancelled, what's the purpose of education? And therefore, what is the, you know, they, they've missed the, the heartbeat of what learning and education is about. So in creating a center for educational possibilities, is it this, is it a center for educational possibilities develops educators capacity and their responsibility, their ability to respond, to bridge research and practitioner wisdom, to implement new invented visions for children's education. And a phrase that, that I think Pam has used and built on or, or created this future making preparedness. Um, how do we prepare children not just to, we can't predict the future, but we're not helping them be prepared for the changes and, and um, to kind of witness the joys and also uh, manage the challenges in their lives. So our educational response in developing this centre would be to think, how do we live sustainably? How do we live with purpose? And how do we live together? Um, and the, the way, so they're, they're kind of very high level um, responses to those risks. And we started mapping out some of these, some of the the, um, the ways that a future making preparedness might be in terms of epistemology, ontology, and creativities and technologies. This is still very new think, new ideas. This, we haven't really um, uh, uh, built on this very much. Um, but you know, thinking more inter and transdisciplinary way rather than still thinking of silos of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then a future making pedagogy that looks at playful inquiry, oracy and dialogue and habits of mind might be something to explore. So a strategic kind of direction for this center, um, is that we have a personnel structure and we've, we've budgeted, we've, we've got the funds, we've, we've budgeted, uh, I've got a, a business model for this. The vice chancellor is now backing it completely. So we're able to access um, the, the university's uh, beast to try and raise money. And we really think we need between 10 and 20 million pounds. And um, what the partnerships, we, this is not done, it's not a center in Cambridge for Cambridge people. This is a, a center hosted in my school um, as a center for educational possibilities, linking with various partnerships, uh, both within the UK at the university, but also kind of the vision is really that we are a host and there are hubs across the world in different universities who relate with schools already, uh, enabling partnerships and dialogue um, to create a new discourse, a more hopeful narrative about the future for young people uh, and with them very much part of that dialogue. So we're working with Cambridge Zero, which is a, um, a, a new centre at Cambridge, just looking across all departments, how do we reduce um, the, the impact of humans on the, on the planet? Um, David Runciman's a, a professor of politics, he advocates for uh, six-year-olds to be able to have the vote. And most people, when they hear him talk about that, are in shock that somebody would, would say such a thing. And he says, well, um, adults who have dementia are, are entitled to vote, so why can't children vote? And when you have that kind of argument, it becomes quite interesting. Um, so we've got a number of partnerships we're trying to, to nurture, um, so it would never be done in, in isolation. Um, and the kind of research areas would be 
children's voices and agency? How do we how do schools really attend to bringing out the voices of children and allow them to have greater agency about their lives and their and their school? Um, curriculum and pedagogy. How do we create new knowledges um, in related to these three substantive areas: of planet Earth. Um, community and individual sense of purpose and meaning, and then professional agency, how do we develop that? So I, I suppose one way in which we might collaborate or learn or to be uh, um, disrupted by your, 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 your body is, um, is to kind of test our thinking as we develop this. And, uh, and I'm hopeful, we're gonna get, I'm determined we're going to get the money, not just hopeful. I'm going to get the money somehow, um, because I think it's so needed and it would, you know, Maxine, I hope you see the DNA of Maxine Green and the work that you do is the foundation. Um, but we want to build beyond and respond to the world that we live now. Um, and, you know, boldly say we want to be Maxine Green part two. <laughs> That's a laudable goal, really. Really impressive. Um, very, very exciting possibility. I actually wanted to ask a question about professional development because um, you alluded to releasing teachers' imaginations, and I really appreciate hearing your thoughtful and compassionate approach to working with teachers. And I just wonder if you have any kind of support or how how you uh, do professional development that um, kind of activates the kind of imagination and playfulness in teachers. Uh, that you want them to convey, convey to their students? So for, for us, it starts with ex experiencing what it's like to be on the edge of learning, you know, on that, on that edge of learning something new. So I get an example, the, our first day in, um, in September, um, rather than me talk through the school development plan uh, and what our targets were, that we shared all that knowledge by putting on a number of a West End musical, by working with a West End, uh, you know, Broadway star. She came and workshopped with us, and we did um, we did uh, some numbers from Les Mis. And through through, I mean, we worked on it quite hard to plan it. But through putting on this Les Mis number, the teachers were having to be out of their comfort zone. They were having to dance and sing with one another. They were having to perform. They were having to reflect on their own anxiety and nerves about being in the space. Um, and then we brought out the school development plans from the words of the songs that we were singing. Um, actually, I didn't bring out the words, they brought out the words. So it was the, the school development plans no longer owned by me, it's owned by them. Um, and we, so that's one example. It started with experiencing what it's like to be creative. We work with an artist, Pam and I work with a, a sculptor um, and we and we we brought her six sculptures into you know, bronze sculptures of children into the school for a number of months, and then the children, the, the adults and the children, but the adults responded to the the artwork, and we created reflexive moments around the artwork in which um, the teachers were engaging, creating their own models, um, and through that became a, a new discourse about what is it? What, why are we here? What is it just about the results? Of course, that's important because we have to keep schools safe, but it's about deepening our awareness of what it means to educate, what it means to be a teacher, what is that relationship about. Um, we, we then, you know, we've documented in this book here, um, which is the second book in the series of Unlocking Research, it's called Reimagining Professional Development in Schools. We, um, each chapter um, is co-written by an academic and a practitioner or a number of practitioners to, to show, to demonstrate the bridging of of research into practice and practice into research. Um, and so other ways, for example, we've, we've, uh, we've changed the title of our teaching assistants to learning coaches, and then we develop them as, as coaches. So they, they have coaching skills. So rather than saying, you need to improve reading, we say, let's improve your coaching skills. So when it comes to reading, you actually have a relational way of engaging with people who are struggling with reading. The other stuff we can teach you easily, it's this, how do we become relational being, you know, beings? Does that answer your question? Kind of, it's a snapshot of what, how we started. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you, James. I also appreciate how you, you now have um, begun to share with us how you utilize or bring in the arts or how important the arts are in that essential um, relational 
uh, experience that experiential uh, portion of the of the um, emergent uh, emergence of the the teachers into this new way of thinking and how important the arts are to that um, not only getting them out of their comfort zone but but helping them with their imagination and creativity um, and is that is that how does that flow into the curriculum do you have the arts in the curriculum in a um because we're a little art centric from where we stand from Lincoln Center. So we're just curious as to how that's how we have been introduced to Maxine. So we're coming at it from that direction. And so we're just uh, I'm, I'm curious as to, as to how you maintain or um, invite the arts in on a daily basis or in, in terms of uh, connecting. Well, should I share with you uh, just something very, it's a very short little video. You can't because you can't be here. I'll, I'll, it's only a couple of minutes long and it talk, it may answer some of the questions and then we hey. can talk about it after. Thank I hope you. This is found. Um, can you hear everything? We've been in the dining room so many times before and um, sometimes we forget that this beautiful piece of artwork that you created has some really important messages um, not only for our normal way of working, but also for welcoming you back to school. So, you know, in this over here, it says, in friendship with empathy, kind words will echo eternally. So we're going to be really focusing on friendship when you come back to school. What other what words can I see here? Um, with gratitude, be more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree. So gratitude is also important. We've got so many things to be grateful for, um, and we're going to be focusing on how we can really celebrate all the wonderful things in our lives. What else can I see? Oh, this is good. We're going to be curious. I'm going to release our imagination. We're really going to think, how can we all come back together and remember what it's like to be brilliant learners? There are many other words you'll see. So when you come back to school, please check this wall because we've got lots of messages that will help you um, flourish to be fantastic learners. <laughs> One class over here. And then, another class is near one, they are doing some drama. So, um, Gina Ruddock, um, who is a professor of education at Cambridge University, um, did a lot of work about uh, people voice, um, and her work carried across the globe. And it really asks the questions, how do we encourage and provide opportunities for children to have a say about their school and how the school functions? So there's not a tokenistic an opportunity. Uh, so this is that, as you come into our school, one of the things we're trying to do is open hearts and minds in our curriculum. Um, how do we help children understand that stumbling is part of the dance? How do we help children learn to be good learners? Um, and that together as a community, a democratic community, how do we collectively use our wisdom and our resources as educators to find a way to for every child. So th th there was some some ways that we've tried to to bring you know bring the arts and the, and creativities into the into the, the, the kind of the, the life of the school um, in explicit ways through art lessons and that that last um, installation the children um, created uh, 
responses to their worries about climate um, and, and nature, and the boxes became an installation that children can move. So the, the message is that children, oh, my light's gone off, the children have agency to create the sculpture um, rather than just being a static piece. That's beautiful. Yeah. What a, was a beautiful example. Wow. James, how do you assess the students' success? I can see like how innovative the students are, are being and how they're and your teachers and how they're being stretched. But given the constraints that you have with, as we do in, in the States with standards that we have to address and reports that we have to do, <coughs> how do you marry the two to show um, that students really are growing um, and yet you still have the math and the reading and yeah. certain expectations of grades and things like that? So we, we, we obviously assess English, reading, writing and maths um, throughout the school year. Um, and, but we, we increasingly are saying, well, we, because we value the values of our school and we value oracy and dialogue, children's ability to, um, to develop these, the kind of four aspects of oracy and dialogue. Uh, the work we're doing this year is actually um, enabling teachers to assess those with more confidence before we try to assess them, but the teacher, we realized we were rushing too much. The teachers didn't have enough knowledge to be able to assess with, with any, any degree of accuracy. Okay. But we're focusing, so uh, next week we have a pupil progress meeting and uh, we're doing reading, writing and maths, but we're also looking at self-regulation and oracy and dialogue. So ch can children make friends? Can they, are they, are they talking, living out the values in, in, in kind of real ways? Um, so, Mm -hmm. We're on a starting journey for that, but we're not, it's, you know, unfortunately, edu you know, in education, people talk about either, it's, it's always binary, it's either this way or that way, but they need to be everything, and they, the children need to be able to read, write, and do maths, but they also, if we're developing compassionate citizenship, we need to be able to evaluate that somehow, so we're doing it through oracy and dialogue and self-regulation as a starting point. Thank you. Wow. Um, so, uh, in the, this is really such a beautiful way of, uh, we can't be there, but we feel closer and closer to uh, that experience of being in your school. It's really fantastic. Um, I'm thinking um, about, about ways that we can support what you're doing and um, uh, amplify it, um, uh, perhaps help you replicate it in other countries, uh, we're opening dialogue with other um, communities that are really um, doing things. I mean, some of our communities are really just working with teaching artists. Some of them are really just working with higher ed. So it's, there are different levels. Um, you're one of the only ones um, that we know of that really is working with a primary school model. And that's spectacular. Um, you know, one starting point, we are, you know, we are, um, I'm really aiming, as soon as we're able to safely to, to bring my leadership team to um, Toronto, to the John Dewey Chicago School, uh, yeah, the, um, to go to Toronto, but also the Chicago School um, and other schools. So if there are other schools that you can, if we can meet you, first of all, that'd be lovely if we can come and meet you um, and see and hear a little bit more about the work you're doing, that would be really great for us. But also, if you, are there any schools that we can visit that you know of that we could connect with um, now, or if we come to visit, that would be a great, a great thing for us because we, we, in some ways, we're kind of stuck here. Not, not stuck, but we're in a, mm -hmm. we're in a bubble of thinking, and we need our thinking needs to be tested and stretched and pulled, pulled apart and put back together again, um, and that would come from the diversity across the pond. Well, it would be great to have you have a conversation with uh, Steve Noonan is the principal of the Maxine Green High School and he's on our board. So it would yeah. be wonderful for you to have a conversation and see how uh, yeah. the, the challenges of moving this work into the secondary school. Yeah. Um, but perhaps uh, uh, cutting down on air travel, it's, it would be really nice to um, have some virtual um, uh, seminars or conferences or yeah. gatherings with some of your leadership team and some of the folks that we know, uh, for example, up in Canada or, um, or you know, some key people. We can continue this conversation through email because I know you, you're. But there's also the, the the Charter College of Teaching is a new professional body in the in the United Kingdom. Um, we've been asked to um, 
Pam doesn't know this, I don't think, but we've been asked to uh, run a series of uh, online seminars uh, based on each of these books. So, you know, the, the Unlocking series book. Um, and so, so that's, that would, that would, potentially, great. That would potentially access 50,000 teachers in the UK, which is a big, big number. Of, um, or whether there's something there that we could, you know, invite you to be part, you know, keen, keen, somebody, a keynote speaker on that hour long uh, seminar series might bring bring alive some of your ideas that we're talking about. Great. I'd like to add, you know, you know, centrally just sitting as a researcher listening to where we all are at the moment, you know, where the center is, where the University of Cambridge Primary School is, where Maxine sits at this point in time. You know, I'll, I'm going to come back to my four V's, which is, you know, they're not original. They're coming directly from Maxine Green's book, uh, Releasing the Imagination, which directly links, you know, links to this, to James's school, which is vision, visibility, values and voices. And the voices, I'm going to start from the bottom and work up, you know, children's voices, teachers' voices, how to make more visible you know and make, bring the connectivity of using technology like this together where practitioners children and teachers head teachers connect together it would be not at all hard to organize a two-hour forum you know that connects the time zones in a, you know so we don't have to sit here in the uk in a onesie at three o'clock in the morning but rather and we have a panel of children you know <laughs> really important maxine green would say where are the children you know so so They're outside to, my office at the moment yes exactly <laughs> yeah. and so you know to to actually bring together you know in a two-hour forum uh together teachers head teachers people who are working you know and amplifying performing you know embodying the work of maxine green let's let's devise a series of 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 uh of meetups um call them what you want will fora webinars you know symposiums meetups you know unconferences you know it's not a conference it's really a a connectivity it's a a really connecting imaginations yeah. i think you know we've already released imaginations <laughs> she's done that it's out there <laughs> but this is really connecting those imaginations to to it to to bring a community together and I think that's what you're seeking is how do we bring community how do we co-create a community that connects because there is incredible stuff going on you know all over the world inspired by Maxine Green how to bring that you know her legacy together that vision together in the sort of visible way but not just to showcase it and then go, you know, go home and have dinner, but rather actually, you know, as James was 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 inviting this sort of partnership um, where 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 schools connect, communities in the schools connect in new ways, new partnerships um, that that do different things in a time of great difference. I mean, we have never lived in such a time of change as we are at the moment. And so, you know, how to use this inspiration and looking at her book, Releasing the Imagine, essays on education, the arts and social change, if ever we need, you know, you know, to amplify and, in, 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 and embody, perform those essays. They are being performed in this school. You know, I, I, I've never seen anything more when J James said the DNA of Maxine Green's thinking, it is embodied in this school. Well, what, who can you connect this school to? And James and his community, his children, the, the students, the teachers, you know, to an, another school. Clearly, there's, you know, in Canada, you're, 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 are you actually visiting Canada? You're taking the staff, James? We're, we're hoping to we're hoping to but we're, obviously we're mindful of not traveling too much um, yeah. there's nothing like actually being in a school with other with children and and yeah. 
and so there's we want to be we want to be careful about where we choose to go yeah so we best and um, i i must uh, actually stop there because um those children are waiting <laughs> come <up> back <laughs> um, but can i just say it's been a really really uh, a, um valuable Thank you. To connect with other people who have uh, have the We're... same kind of love for this kind of way of yeah. engaging people well, um, if anything's possible, I think this group, you know, we're, we're very open to see what's possible. Well, we send all our um, our appreciation and energy your way. It doesn't sound like you really, you're doing it on your own, but we you, uh, yeah. just know that we have your back. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're looking to the next generation to carry on what she inspired in us. And um, many of us are professors of teaching teachers at this point. And so there's just layers and layers of um, voices that we can call upon, I think.